If response is built to be positive, but not before, enter the air and merge the status of the and look out through the enemy's eyes of what appears out of the boat in an alien world. Seal the egg, close the eyes of lab and await development. At the first sign of stress and fatigue, return to mundane consciousness by opening the eyes and by forcing out of the egg in the form determined by the experiences within. Perform astrally, the vanishing ritual of the pentagram of Earth at the eight spaces, and record all the experiences in detail, paying particular attention to the lunar days and any physiological phenomena. It is Tuesday, July 12th, 6.25 p.m. I'm going to read Chapter 6 of Part 4 of Book 4, The Great Revelation, The Arising of the Beast, 6.6692. It has been judged best to reprint as it stands the account of these matters originally compiled in the Temple of Solomon the King, the Equinox 1.7, pages 357 through 386. The notes for this article were worked out in collaboration with Captain, now Major General, J.F.C. Fuller. Every means of cross-examination was pressed to the utmost. The Priest In opening this, the most important section of Freder P.'s career, we may be met by the unthinking with the criticism that since it deals rather with his relation to others than with his personal attainment, it has no place in this volume. Projected by Fuller as no more than a record of the personal attainment of Aleister Crowley. Such criticism is indeed shallow. True, the incidents which we are about to record took place on planes material or contiguous thereto. True, so obscure is the light by which we walk that much must be left in doubt. True, we have not as yet the supreme mystical attainment to record. But on the other hand, it is our view that the seal upon attainment may be itself fittingly recorded in the story of that attainment, and that no step in progress is more important than that when it is said to the aspirant, now that you are able to walk alone, let it be your first care to use that strength to help others. And so this great event which we are able to describe, an event which will lead, as time will show, to the establishment of a new heaven and a new earth for all men, wore the simplest and humblest guise. So often the gods come clad as peasants or as children. Nay, I have listened to their voices in stones and trees. However, we must not forget that there are persons so sensitive and so credulous that they are convinced by anything. I suppose that there are nearly as many beds in the world as there are men, yet for the evangelical every bed conceals its Jesuit. We get Milton composing baby rhymes and Locke reasoning in gibberish, divine revelations which would shock the intelligence of a sheep or a Saxon, and we find these upheld and defended with skill and courage. Therefore, since we are to announce the divine revelation made to Freder P., it is of the last importance that we should study his mind as it was at the time of the unveiling. If we find it to be the mind of a neurotic, of a mystic, of a person predisposed, we shall slight the revelation. If it be that of a sane man of the world, we shall attach more importance to it. If some dingy alchemist emerges from his laboratory and proclaims to all tooting that he has made gold, men doubt. But the conversion to spiritualism of Professor Lombroso made a great deal of impression on those who did not understand that his criminology was but the heaped delusion of a diseased brain. So we shall find that the AA subtly prepared Freder P. by over two years training in rationalism and indifference for their message. And we shall find that so well did they do their work that he refused the message for five years more, in spite of many strange proofs of its truth. We shall find even that Freder P. had to be stripped naked of himself before he could effectively deliver the message. The battle was between all that mighty will of his and the voice of a brother who spoke once and entered again into his silence, and it was not Freder P. who had the victory. We left Freder P. in the autumn of 1901, having made considerable progress in yoga. We noted that in 1902 he did little or nothing either in magic or mysticism. The interpretation of the occult phenomena which he had observed occupied him exclusively, and his mind was more and more attached to materialism. What are phenomena, he asked. Of noumena I know and can know nothing. All I know is, as far as I know, a mere modification of the mind, a phase of consciousness. And thought is a secretion of the brain. Consciousness is a function of the brain. If this thought was contradicted by the obvious in what is the brain a phenomenon in mind, it weighed less with him. It seemed to his mind as yet unbalanced, as all minds are unbalanced until they have crossed the abyss, that it was more important to insist on matter than on mind. 
Idealism wrought such misery was the father of all illusion, never led to research, and yet what odds? Every act or thought is determined by an infinity of causes, is the resultant of an infinity of forces. He analyzed God, saw that every man had made God in his own image, saw the savage and cannibal Jews devoted to a savage and cannibal God, who commanded the rape of virgins and the murder of little children. He saw the timid inhabitants of India, races continually the prey of every robber tribe, inventing the effeminate Vishnu, while under the same name their conquerors worshipped a warrior, the conqueror of demon swans. He saw the flower of the earth throughout all time, the gracious Greeks, what gracious gods they had invented. He saw Rome, in its strength devoted to Mars, Jupiter, and Hercules, in its decay turning to emasculate Attis, slain Adonis, murdered Osiris, crucified Christ. He could even trace in his own life every aspiration, every devotion, as a reflection of his physical and intellectual needs. He saw, too, the folly of all this supernaturalism. He heard the Boers and the British pray to the same Protestant God, and it occurred to him that the early success of the former might be due rather to superior valor than to superior praying power, and their eventual defeat to the circumstance that they could only bring 60,000 men against a quarter of a million. He saw, too, the face of humanity mired in its own blood that dripped from the leeches of religion fastened to its temples. In all this, he saw man as the only thing worth holding on to, the one thing that needed to be saved, but also the one thing that could save it. All that he had attained then, he abandoned. The intuitions of the Kabbalah were cast behind him with a smile at his youthful folly. Magic, if true, led nowhere. Yoga had become psychology. For the solution of his original problems of the universe, he looked to metaphysics. He devoted his intellect to the cult of absolute reason. He took up once more with Kant, Hume, Spencer, Huxley, Tyndall, Maudsley, Manzel, Feit, Schelling, Hegel, and many another, while as for his life, was he not a man? He had a wife, he knew his duty to the race and to his ancient graft thereof. He was a traveler and a sportsman, very well then live it. So we find that from November 1901 he did no practices of any kind until the spring equinox of 1904, with the exception of a casual week in the summer of 1903, and an exhibition game of magic in the king's chamber of the Great Pyramid in November 1903, when by his invocations he filled that chamber with a brightness as of full moonlight, only to conclude, there, you see it? What's the good of it? This was no subjective illusion. The light was sufficient for him to read the ritual by. We find him climbing mountains, skating, fishing, hunting big game, fulfilling the duties of a husband. We find him with the antipathy to all forms of spiritual thought and work which marks disappointment. If one goes up the wrong mountain by mistake, as may happen, no beauties of that mountain can compensate for the disillusionment when the error is laid bare. Leah may have been a very nice girl indeed, but Jacob never cared for her after that terrible awakening to find her face on the pillow when, after seven years' toil, he wanted the expected Rachel. So Freighter P, after five years barking up the wrong tree, had lost interest in trees altogether, as far as climbing them was concerned. He might indulge in a little human pride. See, Jack, that's the branch I cut my name on when I was a boy. But even had he seen in the forest the tree of life itself, with the golden fruit of eternity in its branches, he would have done no more than lift his gun and shoot the pigeon that flitted through its foliage. Of this withdrawal from the vision, the proof is not merely deducible from the absence of all occult documents in his dossier, and from the full occupation of his life in external and mundane duties and pleasures, but is made irrefragable and emphatic by the positive evidence of his writings. Of these we have several examples. Two are dramatizations of Greek mythology, a subject offering every opportunity to the occultist. Both are markedly free from any such illusions. We have also a slim booklet, Rosa Mundi, in which the joys of pure human love are pictured without the faintest tinge of mystic emotion. Further, we have a play, The God Eater, in which the origin of religion as conceived by Spencer or Fraser is dramatically shown forth. And lastly, we have a satire, Why Jesus Wept, hard, cynical, and brutal in its estimate of society, but careless of any remedy for its ills. It is as if the whole past of the man with all its aspiration and attainment was blotted out. He saw life, for the first time perhaps, with commonplace human eyes. Cynicism he could understand, romance he could understand, all beyond was dark. Happiness was the bedfellow of contempt. We learn that, late in 1903, he was proposing to visit China on a sporting expedition, when a certain very commonplace communication made to him by his wife caused him to postpone it. 
Let's go and kill something for a month or two, said he, and if you're right, we'll get back to nurses and doctors. So we find them in Hambantota, the southeastern province of Ceylon, occupied solely with buffalo, elephant, leopard, sambur, and the hundred other objects of the chase. We here insert extracts from the diary, indeed a meter production after what we have seen of his previous record in Ceylon. Whole weeks pass without word. The great man was playing bridge, poker, or golf. The entry of February 19th reads as if it were going to be interesting, but it is followed by that of February 20th. It is, however, certain that about the 14th of March he took possession of a flat in Cairo, in the season. Can Bathos go further? So that the entry of March 16th is dated from Cairo. Freder P.'s Diary Our notes in the diary entries are given in round brackets and in italics. This diary is extremely incomplete and fragmentary. Many entries, too, are evidently irrelevant or blinds. We omit much of the latter two types. This eventful year, 1903, finds me at a nameless camp in the jungle of a southern province of Ceylon. My thoughts, otherwise divided between yoga and sport, are diverted by the fact of a wife. This reference to yoga is the subconscious magical will of the vowed initiate. He was not doing anything, but on questioning himself, as was his custom at certain seasons, he felt obliged to affirm his aspiration. January 1st. Much blotted out. Missed deer and hair. So annoyed. Yet the omen is that the year is well for works of love and union, ill for those of hate. Be mine of love. Note that he does not add and union. January 28th. Embark for Suez. February 7th, Suez. February 8th, landed at Port Said. February 9th to Cairo. February 11th saw BFG BFB. This entry is quite unintelligible to us. February 19th to Helwan is Oriental Despot. Apparently P had assumed some disguise, probably with the intention of trying to study Islam from within, as he had done with Hinduism. February 20th began golf. March 16th began invocation of IAO, given in Liber Samek, see Appendix 4, page 513. March 17th, Thoth appeared, the Egyptian god of wisdom and magic. March 18th, told to invoke Horus as the sun by new way. March 19th, did this badly at noon 30. March 20th, at 10 p.m. did well, equinox of gods. Oi May, Nav, New, CRC, Christian Rosy Cross, we conjecture. Hori, now Hypnet, obviously Arafant. March 21st, Sol and Aries, IAM, Yod Aleph Mem, 1 o'clock. March 22nd, XPB, Zadi Pei Beth, Arabic, probably Ahira or Ahida. The context suggests a proper name. May this, in the entry March 24, refer to the brother of the AA who found him? EPD, or Hey Pei Daleth, in 84M. Unintelligible to us, possibly a blind. March 23rd, YK Dun, his work on the Yi King, or Yi Ching. March 24th, met Ahira again. March 25th, 823, thus, 461, PFLY2BZ, 218, blot, which trouble with DS, blot, PB or pay, Beth, all unintelligible, possibly a blind. April 6, go off again to H or Hay, taking A's or LF's place. This is probably a blind. Before we go further into the history of this period, we must premise as follows. Freighter P never made a thorough record of this period. He seems to have wavered between absolute skepticism in the bad sense, a dislike of the revelation on the one hand, and real enthusiasm on the other, and the first of these moods would induce him to do things to spoil the effect of the latter, hence the blinds and the stupid meaningless ciphers which deface the diary, and, as if the gods themselves wished to darken the pylon, we find later when P's proud will had been broken, and he wished to make straight the way of the historian, his memory, one of the finest memories in the world, was utterly incompetent to make everything certain. However, nothing of which he was not certain will be entered in this place. We have one quite unspoiled and authoritative document, the Book of Results, written in one of the small Japanese vellum notebooks which he used to carry. Unfortunately, it seems to have been abandoned after five days. What happened between March 23rd and April 8th? See also Crowley's later summary and analysis of this period in chapter 7, page 433. The Book of Results. March 16th. D. Mercury, i.e. Wednesday. D or Ds is Latin for day. In later entries, Jupiter is Thursday, Venus is Friday, Saturn is Saturday, Sol is Sunday. I invoke IAO, intuition to continue ritual day and night for a week. 
Frater P. tells us that this was done by the ritual of the Bornless One, identical with the preliminary invocation in the Goetia, merely to amuse his wife by showing her the sylphs. She refused or was unable to see any sylphs, but became inspired and kept on saying they are waiting for you. 16 continued. W. says they are waiting for me. March 17th, Thursday. It is all about the child, also all Osiris. Note the cynic and skeptic tone of this entry, how different it appears than the light of Liber 418. March 17th continued. Thoth invoked with great success and dwells us. Yes, but what happened? Frater P. has no sort of idea. The maiden name of his wife was Rose Edith Kelly. He called her Owarda, the Arabic for Rose. She is hereafter signified as Owarda the Seer, or W for short. In chapter 7, page 433, Crowley notes, I invoke Thoth, probably as in Liber 64. March 18th, Friday. Revealed that the waiter was Horus, whom I had offended and ought to invoke. The ritual revealed in skeleton. Promise of success Saturday or Sunday and of Samadhi. Is this waiter another sneer? We are uncertain. The revealing of the ritual by W. the Seer consisted chiefly in a prohibition of all formulae hitherto used, as will be seen from the text printed below. It was probably on this day that P. cross-examined W. about Horus. See, however, chapter 7, page 434, where Crowley notes, the cross-examination must have taken place between March 20th and 23rd. Only the striking character of her identification of the god surely would have made him trouble to obey her. He remembers that he only agreed to obey her in order to show her how silly she was, and he taunted her that nothing could happen if he broke all the rules. Here, therefore, we insert a short note by Frater P. How W knew RHK Rahur Kuit. 1. Force and Fire. I asked her to describe his moral qualities. 2. Deep blue light. I asked her to describe the conditions caused by him. This light is quite unmistakable and unique, but of course her words, though a fair description of it, might equally apply to some other. 3. Horus. I asked her to pick out his name from a list of ten dashed off at haphazard, one-tenth. 4. Recognized his figure when shown. This refers to the striking scene in the Bulak Museum, which will be dealt with in detail. 5. Knew my past relations with God. This means, I think, that she knew I had taken his place in temple, etc., and that I had never once invoked him. See the Temple of Solomon the King in the Equinox 1-2, the neophyte ritual of the Golden Dawn. 6. Knew his enemy. I asked, Who is his enemy? Reply, Forces of the Water, of the Nile. W. knew no Egyptology or anything else. 7. Knew his lineal figure and its color. 1 out of 12 and 1 out of 7, a 1 out of 84 chance. 8. Knew his place in temple, a 1 in 4 chance at the least. 9. Knew his weapon, from a list of 6, 1 out of 6. 10. Knew his planetary nature, from a list of 7 planets, 1 out of 7. 11. Knew his number, from a list of 10 units, 1 out of 10. 12. Picked him out of A, 5, B, 3, indifferent, i.e. arbitrary symbols. This means that I settled in my own mind that say D of A, B, C, D, and E should represent him, and that she then said D. We cannot too strongly insist on the extraordinary character of this identification. W had made no pretension to clairvoyance, nor had P ever tried to train her. P had great experience with clairvoyance, and it was always a point of honor with him to bowl them out. And here was a novice, a woman who should never have been allowed outside a ballroom, speaking with the authority of God, and proving it by unhesitating correctness. One slip and Frater P would have sent her to the devil, and that slip was not made. Calculate the odds. We cannot find a mathematical expression for tests 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 6, but the other 7 tests give us 1 out of 10 times 1 out of 84 times 1 out of 4 times 1 out of 6 times 1 out of 7 times 1 out of 10 times 1 out of 15 equals 21 million to 1 against her getting through half the ordeal. Even if we suppose what is absurd, that she knew the correspondences of the Kabbalah as well as Frater P, and had knowledge of his own secret relations with the unseen, we must strain telepathy to explain test 12. We may add, too, that Frater P. thinks, but is not quite certain, that he also tested her with the Hebrew alphabet and the tarot trumps, in which case the long gods must be still further multiplied by 484, bringing them over the billion mark. But we know that she was perfectly ignorant of the subtle correspondences, which were only existing at that time in Frater P.'s own brain. 
and even if it were so, how are we to explain what followed, the discovery of the Stella of Revealing? To apply test 4, Freighter P took her to the museum at Bulak, which they had not previously visited. She passed by, as P noted with silent glee, several images of Horus. They went upstairs. A glass case stood in the distance, too far off for its contents to be recognized. But W recognized it. There, she cried, there he is. Freighter P advanced to the case. There was the image of Horus, in the form of Rahur Kuit, painted upon a wooden stella of the 26th dynasty, and the exhibit bore the number 666. 666 had been taken by Freighter P as the number of his own name, the Beast, long years before in his childhood. There could be no physical causal connection here, and coincidence sufficient to explain this one isolated fact becomes inadequate in view of the other evidence. And after that, it was five years before Freighter P was forced to obedience. This incident must have occurred before the 23rd of March, as the entry on the date refers to Ankhaf Nakansu. Ankhaf Nakansu is first mentioned in the Tarot Divination in the March 23rd entry on page 414. P's description of the Stella is on the Recto page opposite the March 21st through 23rd entries in the MS. Here is P's description of the Stella. In the museum at Cairo, number 666, is the Stella of the priest Ankhaf Nakansu. Horus has a red disc and a green ureus. His face is green, his skin indigo. His necklace, anklets, and bracelets are gold. His nemes nearly black from blue. His tunic is the leopard's skin, and his apron green and gold. Green is the wand of double power. His right hand is empty. His throne is indigo the gnomon, red the square. The light is gamboge. Above him are the winged globe and the bent figure of the heavenly Isis, her hands and feet touching earth. Here is one other object to complete the secret of wisdom or it is in the hieroglyphs. This last paragraph is, we suppose, dictated by W. We print the most recent translation of this Stella by Monsieurs Alan Gardner, Lit D, and Battistome Gunn. It differs slightly from that used by Freighter P, which was due to the assistant curator of the museum at Bulak, Stella of Ankhaf Nakansu. Obverse. Topmost register, under winged disc. Bedet, or Hadith, the great god, the lord of heaven. Middle register, two vertical lines to left. Ra Herakati, master of the gods. Five vertical lines to right. Osiris, the priest of Montu, lord of Thebes, opener of the doors of Nut in Karnak. Ankhaf Nakansu, the justified. Below altar, oxen, geese, wine, bread. Behind the god is the hieroglyph of Amenti. Lower register, one. Saith Osiris, the priest of Montu, lord of Thebes, the opener of the doors of Nut and Karnak, Ankhaf Nakansu, the justified. Hail, thou whose praise is high, the highly praised, thou great willed, O soul, ba, very awful, literally mighty of awe, that giveth the terror of him. 3. Among the gods, shining in glory upon his great throne, making ways for the soul, ba, for the spirit, yek, and for the shadow, cobbed. I am prepared, and I shine forth as one that is prepared. 4. I have made way to the place in which are Ra, Tum, Kepri, and Hathor. Osiris, the priest of Montu, lord of Thebes. 5. Ankhaf Nakansu, the justified, son of Menebs Nimet, the father's name. The method of spelling shows that he was a foreigner. There is no clue to the vocalization. Born of the Sistrum Bear of Ammon, the lady Atni Sher. Reverse. Eleven lines of writing. 1. Saith Osiris, the priest of Montu, lord of Thebes, Ankhaf Nakansu, the justified. My heart from my mother, my heart from my mother, my heart of my existence, upon earth, stand not forth against me as a witness, drive me not back, among the sovereign judges, neither incline against me in the presence of the great God, the lord of the west. Osiris, of course. Now that I am united with earth and the great west, and endure no longer upon earth, saith Osiris, he who is in Thebes, Ankhaf Nakansu the Justified. O oh, only one, shining like, or in the moon. Osiris Ankhaf Nakansu has come forth upon high, among these thy multitudes. He that gathereth together those that are in the light, the underworld, Duat, is also open to him. Lo, Osiris Ankhaf Nakansu cometh forth by day, to do all that he wisheth upon earth among the living. We now return to the Book of Results. March 19th, Saturday. The ritual written out and the invocation done, little success. 
March 20th, Sunday, revealed that the equinox of the gods has come, Horus taking the throne of the east and all rituals, etc., being abrogated. We cannot make out if this revelation comes from W or is a result of the ritual, but almost certainly the former, as it precedes the great success entry. To explain this, we append the Golden Dawn ritual of the equinox, which was celebrated in the spring and autumn within 48 hours of the actual dates of Sol entering Aries and Libra. The analogy is between the new formula given by the word every six months in the order, and that given every couple of thousand years, more or less, by the word of a magus to the whole or part of mankind. See also chapter 8 and appendix 9. March 20th continued. Great success in midnight invocation. The other diary says 10 p.m. See Frater P's diary, page 409. Midnight is perhaps a loose phrase, or perhaps marks the climax of the ritual. March 20th continued. I am to formulate a new link of an order with the solar force. It is not clear what happened in this invocation, but it is evident from another note of certainly later date that great success does not mean samadhi. In the manuscript, the full text of this note is, Golden Dawn to be destroyed, i.e. publish its history and its papers. Nothing needs buying. I make it an absolute condition that I should obtain samadhi in the God's own interest. My rituals work out well, but I need the transliteration. For P. writes, I make it an absolute condition that I should attain samadhi in the God's own interest. His memory concurs in this. It was the samadhi attained in October 1906 that set him again in the path of obedience to this revelation. But that great success means something very important is clear enough. The sneering skeptic of the 17th of March must have had a shock before he wrote those words. March 21st, Monday. Soul enters Aries, i.e. spring begins. March 22nd, Tuesday, the day of rest on which nothing whatever of magic is to be done at all. Wednesday is to be the great day of invocation. This note is due to W's prompting, or to his own rationalizing imagination. March 23rd, Wednesday, the secret of wisdom. We omit the record of a long and futile tarot divination. The manuscript preserves this tarot divination. At this point, we may insert the ritual which was so successful on the 20th. Invocation of Horus according to the divine vision of W. the Seer. The manuscript of this ritual bears many internal remarks of having been written at white heat and left unrevised, save perhaps for one glance. There are mistakes in grammar and spelling unique in all manuscripts of Freighter P. The use of capitals is irregular and the punctuation almost wanting. To be performed before a window open to the east or north, without incense. The room filled with jewels but only diamonds to be worn. A sword unconsecrated, forty-four pearl beads to be told, stand, bright daylight at twelve-thirty noon, lock doors, white robes, bare feet, be very loud, die Saturn or Saturday. The above is W's answer to various questions posed by P. Preliminary. Banish, lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram, lesser banishing ritual of the hexagram, flaming sword, abrahadabra, invoke, as before. These are P's idea for the ritual. W replied, omit. Use the sign of Apophis and Typhon. In York Manuscript 27, Crowley annotates the instruction, use the sign of Apophis and Typhon, as follows. This written after, when the preliminary opposite was cancelled. This preliminary refers to the instructions omitted at W's order, given opposite in the manuscript and above in the present text. Unprepared in invoking thee, I, Om, Praetor RR at AC, am here in thy presence, for thou art everywhere, O Lord Horus, to confess humbly before thee my neglect and scorn of thee. How shall I humble myself enough before thee? Thou art the mighty and unconquerable Lord of the universe. I am a spark of thine unutterable radiance. How should I approach thee? But thou art everywhere. But thou hast graciously designed to call me unto thee, to this exorcism of art, that I may be thy servant, thine adept, O bright one, O son of glory. Thou hast called me. Should I not then hasten to thy presence? With unwashen hands therefore I come unto thee, and I lament my wandering from thee, but thou knowest. Yeah, I have done evil. If one blasphemed thee, why should I therefore forsake thee? But thou art the avenger, all is with thee. Doubtless a reference to SRMD, who was much obsessed by Mars. P saw Horus at first as Jabura, later as an aspect of Tifreth including Chesed and Jebra, the red triangle inverted, an aspect opposite to Osiris. 
I bow my neck before thee, and as once thy sword was upon it, so am I in thy hands. Strike if thou wilt, spare if thou wilt, but accept me as I am. My trust is in thee, shall I be confounded? This ritual of art, this forty and fourfold invocation, this sacrifice of blood, these I do not comprehend. Merely we suppose that forty-four equals daleth mem, blood. Possibly a bowl of blood was used. P thinks it was in some of the workings at this time, but is not sure if it was this one. It is enough if I obey thy decree. Did thy fiat go forth for my eternal misery? Were it not my joy to execute thy sentence on myself? For why? For that all is in thee and of thee. It is enough if I burn up in the intolerable glory of thy presence. Enough. I turn toward thy promise. Doubtful are the words. Dark are the ways. But in thy words and way is light. Thus then now, as ever, I enter the path of darkness. If haply so, I may attain the light. Hail. 1. Strike, strike the master cord. Draw, draw the flaming sword. Crown child and conquering lord. Horus, avenger. 1. O thou of the head of the hawk, thee, thee I invoke. At every thee I invoke throughout the whole ritual give the sign of Apophis. A. Thou only begotten child of Osiris thy father and Isis thy mother. He that was slain, she that bore thee in her womb, flying from the terror of the water. Thee, thee I invoke. 2. O thou whose apron is of flashing white, whiter than the forehead of the morning, thee, thee I invoke. B. O thou who hast formulated thy father and made fertile thy mother, thee, thee I invoke. 3. O thou whose garment is of golden glory, with the azure bars of sky, thee, thee I invoke. C. Thou who didst avenge the horror of death, thou the slayer of Typhon, thou who didst lift thine arms, and the dragons of death were as dust, thou who didst raise thine head, and the crocodile of Nile was abased before thee, thee, thee I invoke. 4. O thou whose nemes hideth the universe with night, the impermeable blue, thee, thee, I invoke. D. Thou who travelest in the boat of Ra, abiding at the helm of the Oftet boat and of the Sektet boat, thee, thee, I invoke. 5. Thou who bearest the wand of double power, thee, thee, I invoke. E. Thou about whose presence is shed the darkness of blue light, the unfathomable glory of the utmost ether, the untraveled and unthinkable immensity of space, Thou who concentrest all the thirty ethers in one darkling sphere of fire, thee, thee, I invoke. 6. O thou who bearest the rose and cross of life and light, thee, thee, I invoke. In York Manuscript 27, opposite this, a note reads, Remain in sign to close of Delta 4 Daleth. The voice of the five, the voice of the six, eleven are the voices. Abra Hadabra. 2. Strike, strike the master cord, draw, draw the flaming sword. Crowned child and conquering lord, Horus, avenger. 1. By thy name of Ra I invoke thee, Hawk of the sun, the glorious one. 2. By the name Harmachis, youth of the brilliant morning, I invoke thee. 3. By thy name Mao I invoke thee, Lion of the midday sun. 4. By thy name Tum, Hawk of the even, Crimson splendor of the sunset, I invoke thee. 5. By thy name Kep Ra I invoke thee, O beetle of the hidden mastery of midnight. A. By thy name, Heru Pakrat, Lord of Silence, beautiful child that standest on the dragons of the deep, I invoke thee. B. By thy name of Apollo, I invoke thee, O man of strength and splendor, O poet, O father. 3. By thy name of Phoebus, that drivest thy chariot through the heaven of Zeus, I invoke thee. D. By thy name of Odin, I invoke thee, O warrior of the north, O renown of the sagas. E. By the name of Jeheshua, O child of the flaming star, I invoke thee. F. By thine own, thy secret name, Huri, thee I invoke. The names are five, the names are six. Eleven are the names, Abra Hadabra. Behold, I stand in the midst. Mine is the symbol of Osiris. To thee are mine eyes ever turned. Unto the splendor of Jabura, the magnificence of Chesed, the mystery of Doth. Thither I lift up mine eyes. This I have sought, and I have sought the unity. Hear thou me. 3. 1. Mine is the head of the man, and my insight is keen as the hawk's. By my head I invoke thee. A. I am the only begotten child of my father and mother. My father is dead. My mother bore me with labor and pain and fear. By my body I invoke thee. 2. 
About me shine the diamonds of radiance, white and pure. By their brightness I invoke thee. B. Mine is the red triangle reversed, the sign given of none, save it be of thee, O Lord. This sign had been previously communicated by W. It was entirely new to P. By the lamin I invoke thee. 3. Mine is the garment of white sewn with gold, the flashing abai that I wear. By my robe I invoke thee. C. Mine is the sign of Apophis and Typhon. By the sign I invoke thee. 4. Mine is the turban of white and gold, and mine the blue vigor of the intimate air. By my crown I invoke thee. D. My fingers travel in the beads of pearl, so run I after thee in thy car of glory. By my fingers I invoke thee. On Saturday, March 19th, the string of pearls broke, so I changed the invocation to My mystic sigils travel in the bark of the Akasa, etc. By the spells I invoke thee. P. 5. I bear the wand of double power and the voice of the master, Abrahadabra. By the word I invoke thee. 5. Mine are the dark blue waves of music, and the song that I made of old to invoke thee. Strike, strike the master chord, draw, draw the flaming sword. Crown child and conquering lord, Horus, avenger. By the song I invoke thee. 6. In my hand is thy sword of revenge, let it strike at thy bidding. By the sword I invoke thee. The voice of the five, the voice of the six, eleven are the voices, abrahadabra. 4. This section merely repeats section 1 in the first person, thus it begins. 1. Mine is the head of the hawk, abrahadabra, and ends. 6. I bear the rose and cross of life and light, Abrahadabra, giving the sign at each Abrahadabra. York Manuscript 27 has, Repeat Alpha 1 LF in the first person. Behold, he is in me, and I in him, etc. Remaining in the sign, the invocation concludes. Therefore I say unto thee, Come thou forth and dwell in me, so that every my spirit, whether of the firmament, or of the ether, or of the earth, or under the earth, on dry land, or in the water, of whirling air or of rushing fire, and every spell and scourge of God, the vast one, may be thee. Abrahadabra. The adoration impromptu. Closed by banishing. I think this was omitted at W's order. P. During the period March 23rd through April 8th, whatever else may have happened, it is at least certain that the work was continued to some extent, that the inscriptions of the Stella were translated for Frater P, and that he paraphrased the latter in verse. For we find him using, or prepared to use, the same in the text of Liber Legis. Perhaps then, perhaps later, he made out the name coincidences of the Kabbalah, to which we must now direct the reader's attention. The manuscript is a mere fragmentary sketch. Name coincidences of the Kabbalah. Cheth equals 8, the sign I was born under, Leo, a solar sign. Cheth equals 418, the number of Abrahadabra and Rahur, and Beleskin. Also, 8 is the great symbol I adore. This may be because of its likeness to infinity, or because of its old golden dawn attribution to death, P being then a rationalist, or for some other reason. So is 0. 0 equals Aleph in the Book of Thoth, or the Tarot. Aleph equals 111 with all its great meanings. Soul equals 6. Now 666 equals my name. The number of the Stella, the number of the beast, see Apocalypse. The number of the sun. The beast, Achia, equals 666 in full, Aleph being 111, Cheth 418, Yod 20, He 6 is H and A, Aleph again is 111. The usual spelling is Shiva. Heri Raha, or 211 plus 201 plus 6 equals 418. Ankaf Nakansu Teth equals 666, i.e. the messenger of God to man. Bez Nemea equals 810. And with Tanet, which is 78, equals 888, or 8 times 111, Cheth times Aleph. Neteru, or Gods, is 666. Montu is 111. Iwas equals 78, the influence or messenger, or the book T. But see the miraculous events connected with the revival of magic, described in Appendix 3, page 507, where he is shown as 93. Tanet is also 78. So much we extract from volumes filled with minute calculations, of which the bulk is no longer intelligible even to Frater P. His memory, however, assures us that the coincidences were much more numerous and striking than those we have been able to produce here. But his attitude is, we understand, that after all, it's all in Liber Legis. Success is thy proof. Argue not, convert not, talk not over much. 
and indeed the commentary to that book will be found sufficient for the most wary of inquirers. Now who, it may be asked, was I was? It is the name given by W to P as that of her informant. Also it is the name given as that of the revealer of Liber Legis. But whether I was as a spiritual being or a man known to Frater P is a matter of the merest conjecture. His number is 78, that of Mesla, the channel through which Macroprosopus reveals himself to, or showers his influence upon, Microprosopus, i.e. the messenger of God to man. So we find Frater P speaking of him at once as of another but more advanced man, at another time as if it were the name of his own superior in the spiritual hierarchy. And to all questions Frater P finds a reply, either pointing out the subtle metaphysical distinction between curiosity and hard work, or indicating that among the brethren names are only lies, or in some other way defeating the very plain purpose of the historian. The same remark applies to all queries with regard to VVVVV. The motto of Frater P is Magister Templi 8.3. He used it in his office of giving out the official books of AA to the world in the equinox, with this addition that in the case he condescends to argue and to instruct. If I tell you, he once said to the present writer, J.F.C. Fuller, that VVVVV is a Mr. Smith and lives at Clapham, you will at once go around and tell everybody that VVVVV is a Mr. Smith of Clapham, which is not true. VVVVV is the light of the world itself, the sole mediator between God and man. And in your present frame of mind, that of a poop stick, you cannot see that the two statements may be identical for the brothers of the AA. Did not your great-grandfather argue that no good thing could come out of Nazareth? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary, and his brother James, and Joseph, and Simon, and Judas? And his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? And they were offended in him. Similarly, with regard to the writing of Liber Legis, Frater P. will only say that it is in no way automatic writing, that he heard clearly and distinctly the human articulate accents of a man. Once, on page 6, he is told to edit a sentence, and once on page 19. W supplies a sentence which he had failed to hear. To this writing we now turn. It must have been on the 7th of April that W commanded P, now somewhat cowed, to enter the temple exactly at 12 o'clock noon on three successive days, and to write down what he should hear, rising exactly at 1 o'clock. This he did. Immediately on taking his seat the voice began its utterance, and ended exactly at the expiration of the hour. These are the three chapters of Liber Legis, and we have nothing to add. The full title of the book is, as P first chose to name it, Liber L. Vel Legis, sub figura 220, as delivered by 418 to 666. And it is the first and greatest of those Class A publications of AA, of which is not to be altered so much as the style of a letter. This was the original title devised by 666 to appear in the 1909 publication. The key of it all and the true spelling of Iwas had not then been discovered.